Right. Lovely. And everything is set, going, brilliant. Okay, so, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I have the privilege of being joined by Gary Gerstel, a professor of American history at Cambridge University and author of the new book, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, which I have very much been enjoying over the past couple of weeks. So, Gary, welcome to the show. No problem. Or do you prefer Professor? Okay, stick to Gary. Um, so, uh, well, I know, why don't you start with, with telling everyone why you decided to write this book and like why you felt it was important? ...of 2008 and 2009, that's when the neoliberal order began to lose its, its hegemony. So this book is about how that order took shape out of the ruins of the New Deal order in the uh, 1970s and 80s uh, under Ronald Reagan and how it triumphed uh, under Bill Clinton's Democratic presidency in the 1990s and how it began to come apart um, during Obama's presidency and, and then even more so uh, in the years of Donald Trump uh, on the right and I would say almost of equal significance the insurgency of Bernie Sanders and a revivified American left on the other side of the political spectrum. Mm. Okay, so uh, we'll get to the the sort of the, at the tail end of the neoliberal order uh, uh, a little later. So I want to I want to go back a wee bit to to your your rise and fall of the the New Deal order, just so because it seems to like set it sets it's like the first first chapter and a half chapter chapter and a half ish for the first book. two chapters. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was it? When what was it that you think that caused the end, the death of that New Deal order? Because it, the the politics of the New Deal had been like supremely popular, and and I don't know, per, perhaps it's, like, I I wasn't around in the eighties, and the, so I I don't know what the what the the general sort of vibe was from the, the ordinary person um, about how they felt about sort of yeah the way politics were were going, but. There's a lot of nostalgia in, in modern politics for that period. So what was it that brought it down in your mind? Well, there, there, uh, there are three main factors. Uh, first, let me say that any political order has fault lines, um, rests on a coalition of forces, a coalition of constituencies, uh, interest groups, think, uh, think tanks, policy networks. Uh, but there, uh, there are alliances and they are powerful, but uh, there are always fault lines where they, where these things can break up. And the New Deal order began to founder um, on two issues. Uh, one was race, the second was Vietnam. And then it cracked up uh, during a fundamental uh, reorientation of the global economy in the 1970s. Uh, the, 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 the New Deal order, it, um, should be understood as a form of social democracy, a, a lighter form of social democracy than was characteristic of Western European societies after World War II, but it's properly understood as, as a social democratic formation. Uh, uh, the conviction that capitalism left to itself was destructive, that it had to be managed in the public interest, that the gap between the rich and the poor had to be narrowed, that the business cycle had to be um, uh, smoothed out uh, so that there would be less suffering during the busts. There had to be a, a robust welfare state for the casualties of this in, industrial system. It, it, the New Deal did all that, but it did not deal well with race at all because one of its key constituencies were white Southerners. And uh, the white Southerners in, in the Democratic Party and part of the New Deal coalition were willing to go along with all those economic programs I just mentioned as long as the New Dealers in Washington promised not to interfere with the racial hierarchies of Southern life. So Jim Crow was left intact and uh, severe um, racial discrimination was left intact and untouched in the Southern states. Uh, but the New Deal also um, set in motion questions of equality, demands for equality. And so civil rights and racial equality could only be put off for so long. And it begins to um, move to the center of the Democratic Party's agenda in the 1960s. And, and, and then the Democratic Party has an existential choice to make, whether to embrace the cause of civil rights and lose the white South, or whether to continue with Jim Crow and racial segregation. It chooses the former, it embraces um, civil rights and racial equality. It was the right decision for the Democratic Party uh, to make, but it costed a very important constituency that had been, had been a foundation of its political power. And then uh, came the war in Vietnam, which was uh, 
a very unwise war can be understood in terms of America's commitment to containing communism everywhere and in, in every form, uh, but it was a dis disastrous war for the United States and uh, disastrous wars abroad always come back to haunt, even if the greatest suffering is being is occurring elsewhere in a land that where the war is going on. Those wars always come back to haunt um, uh, the mainland and, and the countries involved in the war and a deeply unpopular war uh, discredited um, what someone who had been a very popular Democrat, Lyndon Johnson, and uh, and also hurt the Democratic Party. Uh, and then came the uh, you know very basic series of reorientations in the global economy. The U.S. enjoyed an extraordinary period of prosperity from the 40s to the 70s. It was preeminent in the world. Most of the other industrialized countries of the world have been been destroyed uh, by World War II. Uh, America had no competitors, which was a mixed blessing because it made American industry all powerful, but you needed consumers abroad to buy American goods. So America very assiduously builds up, rebuilds, helps to rebuild the economies of Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and uh, by the 19. 70s, especially Germany and Japan, I have these modernized, efficient, high productivity industrial plants that in many respects are more efficient than the American plants. And suddenly uh, America has severe economic competitors in, in the world and, and they're not ready for it in, in any form. And the 1970s is the decade in which foreign cars invade America in a big way and <laughs> they have never left. Uh, and, uh, so this is a, a moment of big transition for American industry. And then on top of that, and this is also related to automobiles and what they run on, there's also a developing conflict between the global north and the global south, the global south emerging from colonial circumstances. This has been something going on for decades. Uh, but in the 1970s, some of the uh, commodity producers in the global south began to demand that they be allowed to control the commodities that res and, and the resources that resided in their land and their territory. And the clearest example of this is petroleum in the Middle East, which until that time, the extraction of it, the setting of prices have been mostly controlled by Anglo-American companies uh, and Saudi Arabia and uh, other countries begin to demand that they be allowed to set the terms on which, how much oil will be taken out of the ground and the circumstances under which it it will be sold. And this uh, radically shifts the terms of tr trade and Western recovery had been built um, on the notion that uh, there was an endless supply of cheap petroleum oil. And so there wasn't a great concern with efficiency and conservation of resources. Uh, and so the industries were inefficient. The cars were inefficient. There were a lot of American cars that used to get eight miles to the gallon. <laughs> <laughs> which during the oil crisis of the 1970s is um, a not a kind of not a good car to have, uh, and, uh, and and this destabilizes um, the American economy very seriously. Uh, so it not only is American industry having competition from Germany and Japan, but suddenly the the resources, the commodities they need to run um, the plants in the United States are vastly more. Uh, expensive. And uh, this is the decade in which heavy industry uh, in America undergoes a severe decline and in, in which uh, the efficient and, and most profitable sectors of production are in other countries or the way in which American corporations decide they can survive is by moving more and more of their production facilities abroad. And so America enters a serious recession in the 1970s and suddenly the toolkit that um, New Deal policymakers have been using is not working anymore. Those associated with John Maynard Keynes, Keynesianism is not working. And uh, there's a lot of unhappiness. Uh, there are mysterious economic ailments, uh, uh, the most important one being called stagflation, something that wasn't supposed to happen. You, you, you either had high inflation and high, and high employment um, or um, uh, or low inflation and the shortage of employment, but you're not supposed to have high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. And that's what hit America very hard. And, uh, and in a decade of distress and economic crisis, ideas that have been consigned to the periphery, these are the neoliberal ideas, get a chance to make a bid for mainstream acceptance. And they do so through an insurgent 
Republican Party and Ronald Reagan is their messenger and their instrument. Okay, so no, I want to I want to kind of address like w what it is that you think led neoliberalism to be the ideas that that sort of prospered in yeah in the absence of the New Deal um, types of yeah economic policies and, and politics failing. But before we do that, I'd like to get you to try and define neoliberalism just for people because. <laughs> Yeah, I I had this problem actually when whenever anyone has said they they've either read or tried to read my book, they said that chapter four is where I lose them because it's me trying to like get my head around and like get explain what neoliberalism is to people. So uh, maybe you could try and like give some sort of succinct explanation for for people um, to uh, help them understand what this is that we're then going to go on to talk about. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's important and it can be a hard term to uh, get one's head around. So it's, it's an important exercise. Um, I define neoliberalism as a creed that wants to unleash capitalism's power and to free markets from constraints. Uh, the doctrine believes that markets left to their own devices can produce the greatest economic growth and thus the greatest economic good. It's a creed that prizes the uh, free movement of capital, goods, information, and people across borders with few or no constraints. It wants to globalize capitalism and deregulate economies. Um, it prizes innovation and disruption. Uh, some who subscribe to the neoliberal creed uh, prize the cultural mixing that goes with globalization. Uh, and it's what I call uh, cos uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, um, a way of living in the world that celebrates diversity. But neoliberalism is also compatible with a very different set of values uh, having to do with traditional patriarchal families. And this is what appeals to conservatives or conservative, conservatively minded people, whereas cosmopolitanism appeals to more liberally or, or left minded people. The conservative appeal is tries to answer this question, as much as free markets are valued and um, embraced, even the most fervent supporters of free markets recognize there are risks. People might spend too much. They, <laughs> they might spend more than they earn. They might, they might borrow uh, ways in ways that deplete their savings. They might indulge their desire for immediate gratification too much. It might be too much alcohol, too much drugs, too much sex too much wasting one's life away, too much video games, whatever you want. Uh, and so even those who wanna free the markets are concerned about how do you discipline individuals to behave properly with markets? And if you're not gonna allow the government to regulate people's behavior in this way or to moderate capitalism, then the answer has to be that um, these people have to regulate themselves and discipline themselves. And, and how are they gonna do that? Well, they do that in strong patriarchal families so the headed by a man who's a breadwinner. The woman stays home. Uh, her job is to uh, produce babies and, and raise them uh, and create a, a loving home for husband and the children and inculcate in the children proper, proper values. Uh, often heterosexuality is, is central to this, to this vision. Uh, and so, uh, and this, this I think is, is very much what Margaret Thatcher had in mind in, in, in Britain. Those, uh, at some time, I call these values neo-Victorian mm. because um, many people in Britain and in America believe that Britain had prospered in the 19th century with free markets and strong families to, to, to put it bluntly. Uh, and uh, the neo-Victorians of late 20th century try and revive this way of thinking, uh, this ideology as, as a way of dis disciplining themselves so that one can enjoy the fruits of what markets have to offer. But uh, so, so this allows, and this is an unusual part of my argument, this allows those on the left and the right to, in some circumstances, both march under a uh, neoliberal banner, which helps, I think, to explain its appeal. But to come back to ground zero, uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism is a creed that wants to unleash capitalism's power and to free markets from constraints. And that, that's where we have to understand um, its essence. And in terms of its appeal in the 1970s, it appeared to be um, just the reverse of what the Keynesians and the New Dealers had been doing, where, where they argued that markets left to their own devices would 
uh, produce uh, economic calamity, um, severe economic depression, tremendous poverty, um, and uh, neoliberalism tries to reverse the relationship between state and markets. The way to revive the economy and to bring prosperity is to is to free markets from all the constraints that New Dealers in America and Social Democrats in Europe had put on those markets. So they were behaving very inefficiently. Capital was not well allocated. Free it up, let capitalism do its work and everything will be wonderful. Hmm. Well, good thing they solved all the problems. Uh, <laughs> so so you think it's basically that, that neoliberalism was providing the, the complete antithesis to what had been tried in the over the so that, that previous sort of 30 year period or 40 year period like that's what it was that's the reason that it became yeah the yeah the ide ideology of the day basically is is that it's that it was providing the almost complete opposite uh yes that's right now some people who write about neoliberalism if they want to distinguish it from classical liberalism say the difference is that neoliberalism uses the state much more to organize and refine markets and market behavior than classical liberalism of the 19th century or the 18th century of the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith ever imagined. Uh, I don't dispute those who argue in this vein who, who say that states are very important to organize and sustain markets. But my point is that is that this is actually does not distinguish neoliberalism from classical liberalism. And here, the fact that I'm a historian comes into play. Mm -hmm. Because we now know markets never arose by themselves, that markets always needed governments to, to organize them and sustain them, and questions of law and, and property and conditions of exchange and punishment for those who break contracts. Uh, so it's, it's, that's not a new phenomenon for neoliberalism. This had been part of classical liberalism as well. But it is true that state activity is okay, that government is, activity is okay, as long as it's being used to uh, organize and sustain markets as opposed to stymie them. Mm. So I assume you mean like markets at scale, like once you get beyond like a handful of people, then you need some sort of like overarching structure. Um, yes. Since, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. To, to, to protect private property, to to govern exchange between people who don't know each other, right? The, if you're gonna have a global market, you're gonna have a lot of buyers and sellers who, who don't know each other and, and can't have instinctive, you know, it's not like they're part of the same clan or tribe. They, they have no instinctive trust of each other. How do you get them to behave in a way? So you, you, need, you need rules and, and orders to govern the exchange of goods and capital and, and people too. Okay, so then I'd, I'd quite like to, to, to focus in on this thing you said about the reason that neoliberalism sort of appealed to both, because like this is this is something that's, that, that's really interesting. Um, and it's something that I find difficult to like, get people to grasp sometimes when I'm talking about about politics, because to me, at least now, this is just my um, half baked and uh, <laughs> naive 20 somethings opinion. But it seems to me that we have a, a situation where both major parties on both sides of the Atlantic are have been broadly in favor of basically the same policies. I mean, I feel like perhaps in America there's a little more difference, especially more recently, um, but broadly they seem to be after the same thing. And that this this idea that it's the freedom and like the free market side that's kind of associated with like traditionalism and, and like maybe more Christian conservative values is appealing to that side of the political spectrum whilst cosmopolitanism and, and globalism is is appealing to to another side like I hadn't actually ever heard anyone explain it in that way as to why because because that that helps explain it a lot more than all the parties are corrupt and they just like money because I don't think that's not true, but I mean that your your explanation helps to flesh out how that became the popular ideology amongst the people as well, which is yeah really interesting. Well, my, my, I should say my my view on for your listeners, some of this some of them will know this, but my my view on this is different from a lot of writing on neoliberalism. Many who write on neoliberalism see it as a, a 
elite project uh, to try and constrain and undermine uh, the democratic, uh, to uh, try and constrain and undermine democracy and, and constrain the participation of ordinary people in, uh, in their politics. And it's about unleashing the power of capital and, and further enriching the rich, impoverishing the poor, holding them down. I don't deny the mechanisms uh, in neoliberalism that are pushing a lot of wealth to the top and a lot of people to the bottom. That certainly is, ha is happening. One only has to compare the gap between CEOs and ordinary workers in 1960 in America with the ratio in 2000. Hmm. In 1960, on average, a CEO made 20 times what an ordinary worker made. That's two zero. In 2000, that same CEO made 300 times what an ordinary worker made. So part of what's characteristic of neoliberalism is a vast expanse of economic inequality. So I don't, I don't deny that, but I, I don't think that neoliberalism, its appeal can be explained just simply as a top-down movement and elites pulling the wool over the masses eyes. I think in America in particular, the promise of neoliberalism uh, connected to older uh, traditions of freedom and individuality. It carried within it a promise of personal emancipation, reinvention, um, becoming someone different that you wanted to be from circumstances you were born into. For most people, this freedom turned out to be false, but the promise of freedom was really very, very powerful. Uh, and, uh, and, and very seductive. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not just people on the right who pursue this uh, message of freedom. I, I look at the new left, um, which arises in the 1960s and is bitterly critical of capitalism and inequality, economic, social, racial, uh, but it's also very critical of the New Deal because it sees in the New Deal not equality and democracy, but a vast system of government uh, cooperation with private corporations to have these mass institutions over which ordinary people had very little control. Uh, and the goal of the new left uh, became to free individual consciousness and people from uh, these vast government private corporate arrangements and so we, even within the new left, there was a movement toward individual and personal freedom that led some in that movement to find neoliberalism appealing, not, not directly because they weren't budding capitalists, but some of them became budding capitalists. If you go back to the origins of Silicon Valley and the IT revolution in the United States, uh, the, uh, the, West, the prominence of the West Coast, uh, people like Steve Jobs, you know, he spent quite a number of years being a hippie while he was inventing his computer and his, the kind of computer he was inventing, the personal computer, was deeply associated with the dream of freedom. Stuart Brand, uh, who uh, was doing a lot of drugs in the 60s and hanging out with Timothy O'Leary and other psychedelics, and, uh, and the, he's the author of the Whole Earth Catalog about um, removing one from ordinary pursuits of life and living autonomously and living genuinely and living authentically, I would say clearly uh, a left message. Uh, he's also going to be one of the creative spirits behind cyberspace and the IT revolution. And at some point, these creative spirits who are very much involved in the IT um, revolution are going to hook up with venture capital from Wall Street and, and build what comes to be the monster of our time, which is Silicon Valley. Uh, so there are roots of neoliberalism on, on, on the left. And, and, uh, and over time, uh, because of other circumstances that become relevant, they, they merge with elements of the new, new right that are also very invested in liberating the individual or liberating the firm from constraints. And they do uh, find a kind of common ground which allows uh, neoliberalism to appeal to to appeal to those on the left and to those on the right. As to your point about all the, the parties are the same, I think at certain moments they become quite similar to each other. But I would also say we have to be um, 
uh, specific about the, the moment in which this is occurring. And mm -hmm. I think it's not true of the Democratic Party in the 1980s, but it, it does become true of the Democratic Party of the 1990s under Bill Clinton, a very similar path to the Labor Party under, under Tony Blair. But at a later time, you also have rebellions within these parties, Jeremy Corbyn in, 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 in Britain and Bernie Sanders in the United States, and a revival of the left. So there, there are, at different moments, um, Concord and then um, attempts at rupture. And we can talk about why those attempts at rupture have been successful or fail or, or, or not. Uh, but it's not simply one steady story of, of two parties always being in cahoots with each other, although there are certainly moments uh, of when neoliberal values are hegemonic in both parties. And that is my definition of a political order, the ability of one political party, in this case, the Republican Party under Ronald Reagan, to compel its antagonist, the Democratic Party, to play on its playing field. And Margaret Thatcher is reputed to have said, this could be apocryphal because uh, there's no recording of Margaret Thatcher having actually said this. It, this was said to someone who asked her a question around to, um, 2000, uh, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? And Tony she's Blair, reported right? to have yeah. said, Tony Blair, right? And that's, 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 a wonderful, that's... that's a wonderful illustration really of, of, of uh, of how hegemony works, where your opponents feel compelled to play on your turf. Because mm. famously, Blair, the first person that Blair, I think, like went to see after winning election, or one of the first people he went to see was apparently, at least, Margaret Thatcher, um, which is, yeah, interesting. But yeah, that's, it is also interesting to me, and maybe this is that the, the, that New Labour essentially, whilst pretending to not be, like literally be the like the anti-Tories when, when they were trying to get elected, assumed a lot of their, yeah, the, the, the neoliberal policies of, of the, yeah, the Thatcher era, and then managed to keep out the original people who conceived of that, of that ideology, essentially, for like, what was it, 12 years? 12 years, mm -hmm. 12 years. Yeah, 12 years uh, or even 13 years. And uh, why do you think that the, because the same thing actually technically, I guess, maybe happened a little bit with, with Clinton, although it's more difficult to say in America just because of the way the terms work. But why do you think it is that, that the parties that initially brought that ideology to bear in like a, in broader politics, then proceeded to lose power to the other party, like doing the same, like yeah, endorsing like a similar ideology. That's, I hadn't actually even considered that. Why do you think that is? It's a really interesting story. And it also helps to explain why Republicans in the 1990s hated Clinton with every bone in their body, because they felt exactly <laughs> what, what you've just been expressing. These are our ideas. This is a moment when we should be dominant in all respects, not just our ideas, but we should have the presidency. We should have both houses of Congress, uh, majorities in both of them. They had that for two years, but um, not, not, be, not, not beyond this. And here comes this man without principles who a shapeshifter and um, he, he steals our thunder. Uh, I think, you know, one, ex one explanation is uh, that both Blair and Clinton were brilliant politicians. Uh, and whatever you think about them in terms of the quality of their politics, and I know, uh, uh, you know, Blair is um, very controversial and in many quarters dis intensely disliked figure in Britain now because of the war in, war in Iraq. You but, could say that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you could say that. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't, that should not detract from our understanding of the brilliance of him as a political figure when he, uh, especially in the early years of his, uh, uh, his prime, ministers, prime ministership. So I think it's partly the brilliance of these, these, these two politicians and, uh, uh, and part of the brilliance of a, pol of a politician is to be able to uh, read the pulse of the electorate uh, and, and, and craft an appeal that is gonna be very popular with them. And I think they, they were both quite 
brilliant in, in that respect. And I think there's a way in which uh, they understood that they could rub some of the harshness off of the neoliberal policies. Uh, and I think both of them did that without undermining liberal, neoliberalism per se, right? Mm. Uh, and, and there may have been a recognition on the part of parts of the electorate. Those parts of the electorate might have said, uh, well, we don't really like neoliberalism, but maybe the Clinton or Blair version will, will be okay. Mm. And it'll certainly be better than the Tory or the Republican version, which is true. Um, and um, so may, we'll go along with it. Yeah. Uh, now there's one other element to this that Matt, uh, there's two other elements that matter to this in terms of the timing. One is the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and of communism between 1989 and 1991. So you don't, you, you've already confessed to being born in the 1990s, right? So yes. <laughs> you, you, won't have, you, you won't have any firsthand memory of this, but it's the, um, the shock of that was extraordinary because no one thought that the Soviet Union and communism would go quietly. It, it was thought it would behave like most declining empires. You just fight forever to maintain whatever you have. And suddenly Gorbachev of the Soviet Union is dismantling the Soviet Union and communism is, is ending with it. So this is a, a tremendous shock. And it um, the political theorist, Fran, uh, Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama once wrote, with the passing of communism, the last universal alternative to liberal capitalism passed from the world. Mm. And, uh, and Blair are the, in a, in a way, Blair and uh, Clinton are the first post communist um, leaders of their countries. And so, uh, uh, and I think the collapse of communism not only obviously buried communism but it created a broader crisis for left politics mm. because the most spectacular experiment in left politics, that being the Soviet Union, yeah. crashed so, so spectacularly. How do you go on being a socialist mm. in that aftermath? How, how, do you, how do you do that? What do your politics look like exactly? This is an understudy in, in under, 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 under poorly understood part of the 90s, but the, 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 these are the first post-communist leaders and uh, the, the collapse of communism effect, it not only made communism untenable, but it, it threw into question really any kind of socialist al alternative because if the, the, the most um, you know, spectacular effort at socialist life had failed completely mm. and was never going to be revived. Uh, and so how do you do socialism after that, after that moment? And so these are the first post-communist leaders of Britain and the United States. And the, the fall of communism by itself changes the political landscape and gives you a different sense of what's possible and what's not. So that's one very important factor informing what's going on in the 90s. The other factor is a, is a techno-utopianism, or what I call a techno-utopianism, that um, encourages a lot of people to think that the IT revolution has made market perfection possible in ways that it never had before. Now, we no longer live in a moment of techno-utopianism. So we have to, re <laughs> we have to reimagine... That's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> we have to imagine ourselves back into this moment of the 1990s. Uh, but this is a moment when Netscape la launches, when... Steve Jobs comes back to Apple and, and revives it. It's, uh, it's when Amazon um, is, is starting up. Uh, it, there's a tremendous amount of uh, hope, and I, I would call it utopianism, uh, surrounding this revolution. And this is going to revive America, and it's going to revive uh, the world. And this seems to be a technological innovation as fundamental as the invention of the Printing press 500 years before. I mean, those are the terms in which it's uh, in which it's being discussed. And part of what it promises is what I what I said before: market perfection. Markets were imperfect because information was imperfect, or so this was the ideology. Mm. And market failed because people didn't have perfect information at their fingertips. Well, now with the IT revolution and computers, and people have access to all kinds of data instantaneously, the way they never had 
instantaneous access before. Now market perfection was within grasp. Mm. And so it was possible for people to believe that the state might once have been necessary to manage markets Mm. and to manage capitalism, but it no longer was. And Clinton buys into this in a big way. And I think Blair does, not, not to the same degree, but to a moderate degree. It's important to recognize the degree to which it it is facilitated by this techno-utopianism. And in, even people on the left are drawn into it. Jo- Joseph Stiglitz, a very prominent economist of the left, Nobel Prize winner, has among his books is a book called The Roaring 90s. And he's trying to figure, he was in the Clinton administration. There was a left wing of the Clinton administration, and there were some left-wing figures in Blair's administration. Mm-hmm. And Stiglitz, reflecting on the 1990s, is trying to figure out why he, too, got caught up to a certain extent in this techno-utopianism. And uh, he he has a wonderful passage uh, where he quotes John F. Kennedy when he goes to Berlin in 1961 to address the Iron Curtain and to make an appeal across the Berlin Wall. Uh, And he says, we are all Berliners now. And Stiglitz says in the 1990s, we all became deregulators. It didn't really matter what part of the political spectrum you thought you were on. Uh, Almost everyone was drinking the techno-utopian deregulatory Mm. Kool-Aid. And so it's a a moment of this techno-utopianism that makes it somewhat easy. It, It helps us understand between that and the fall of communism, it helps us to understand why the 90s are such a crucial decade of transition and hegemony and triumph of neoliberalism. So it's not just the personalities of these men, it's the world in which they are living is changing measurably before their lives. And you know, the equivalent for us may be um, Ukraine, which is causing the world to change in, in me, you know, ways that are measurable in, our, in, our, in months and, 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 and years. So it's a, it, the 90s were a very fundamental transition. And uh, I think that helps us understand the, the moves that Blair and Clinton made. Yeah. It's interesting that you, you mentioned that, that their brand of neoliberalism, because that's, that's interesting. It's almost like the, the, the left or, yeah, the sort of left side of the, the, the spectrum can could could tolerate the idea like the the sort of freedom free market sort of side of things because it was packaged up in like a globalist like cosmopolitan guy in a in you know a sharp suit and a nice haircut and a young guy and that's that's really interesting because yeah and and the techno utopian um sort of utopianism is when you were when you were speaking there about it, because this, this didn't dawn on me when I was reading, but when when you were talking about it, it's, that's still something that infuses the modern left, like the far left as well, to an extent. Like there's a guy I don't know if you're familiar with Navara Media in in the UK and, and Aaron Bastani, um, and he has a book called Fully Automated Luxury Communism, um, and like that's what that's techno utopianism, but they want it to facilitate their. They, they, yeah, their their ideals of like a communist utopia, but they're still hoping that technology will be that that the driver of that revolution. So yeah, that that's mm. you know, a strong a, a strong element of left politics, really since the days of Karl Marx, uh, has um, has been a belief that technology, if if properly harnessed, can set us free. Uh, and, uh, you know, Marx admired capitalism for building this incredible infrastructure and paving the way for a kind of proletarian emancipation. Mm. And Lenin in the 1920s, uh, he's sending his people to study Henry Ford and the assembly line and the principles of scientific management, which is at the heart of American capitalism. Mm. Because they, again, they think there's a technology here that holds the key to working class emancipation. You combine that technology with our um, principles of proletarian democracy and justice and regulation and good things will result. So there's a long and deep history of a belief that technology on the left of technology properly harnessed, um, making us free. Mm. And so I think the left as well as the right is susceptible to this, this techno utopianism and not all, not all of it is, has, past from the world as 
you've you've just identified, but it is it is not hege hegemonic in the same way that it was in the 1990s, because of course now there are you know very serious critics of the IT revolution and social media platforms and what it's done to our politics, and that critique is not really there in the 1990s. It's mm. not there. Well. Maybe it was, we just didn't see it posted on everyone's yeah. Twitter timelines. <laughs> that's that's actually something um I spoke to um Paolo um Gerbado from I think it's King's College, and we spoke about how he doesn't think that people have got any crazier. He just thinks that none of us are prepared to see the consistent like inner workings of everyone's craziest opinions posted on their feeds at twenty four seven. Which was yeah, definitely interesting. I mean it's yeah because yeah. people were always a bit nuts i mean you can't, you can't blame social media for that yes <laughs> yes yes i think what social media does is is is, is license and uh, reward a certain kind of craziness and impulsiveness right mm. um, but yes i think the fact that the idea that human nature has changed in some radical way no that has not happened <laughs> mm. So uh, then I want to try and talk about some of the, the challenges to this order or some of the more significant ones from the last couple of years. And you, you've mentioned all of them, actually, the ones that I would have um, talked about that would be uh, Corbyn, Sanders, uh, Brexit and Trump, basically, um, which are uh, actually, interestingly, both. You've got one from each side of the political spectrum coming um, on both sides of the, the Atlantic, actually. But. To me, at least, it looks like these challenges have sort of come like waves on the beach and maybe dragged something with them, but they haven't actually seemingly changed fundamentally the ideological makeup of, of, of e any of the major parties, from what I can tell. I mean, the, the Democrats flirted with with a, a far more, uh, I don't know, quote-unquote progressive, um, yeah, platform um like bernie sanders pulled them all sort of left on a lot of issues due to his popularity and then once they've got into government it doesn't look like they have yeah really pursued that many of those policies at least today uh, it's it feels like it's sort of gone back to a little bit more of like business as usual um and then within britain as well like the the tories there's a lot of rhetoric about you know the leveling up or um, how they were going to, you know, release Britain and make it wonderful and, and free it from the shackles of the tyrannical EU SSR. And, we're, and again, it, it feels very much like we've gone back to like a neoliberal business as usual. Uh, do you, is, would you say that's a fair comment or maybe you disagree or maybe I'm looking at it on too short a time scale? Uh, I don't think we've gone back to business as usual. I think it's... Um... I, th I think a lot of things are in motion now that were not in motion before. You you may be right that at some point, I mean, I, I, I don't agree with your current analysis, like the, the neoliberal order has been restored. That's not to say that couldn't happen in the future, you know, and it's not to say that it won't happen sometime in the next five years. Uh, but I think it, it, in my view, it's wrong to say that it has restored itself. Mm. Um, well, what would you now? say is different now then? What's what is what of those like di different like insurgencies against the 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 sort of yeah the neoliberal order? What have they changed that I'm missing? Well, the um, we have to distinguish between changing political parties and changing economic economic circumstances. So let me deal with each of them. I actually think the Democratic Party and the Labour Party both changed. Uh, I, I think um, there's been, you know, Bernie Sanders is now the second most important socialist in all of American history, second only to Eugene Victor Debs, who lived 100 years before him. Uh, he's a very significant figure. And uh, the Democrats had committed themselves to a different kind of politics, one where there's very important dialogue between center and left. The point uh, is that not that they, uh, nothing changed. The point is that they they did change and they failed to take the country with them. And one can say something similar about Corbyn. Corbyn changed the Labor Party from what it had been like under Blair, but they, then the Labor Party failed to take the country with it. Uh, it's a question of whether, if Corbyn's Brexit politics had been different, whether, I don't know the answer to that question, but yeah, I just, I just yeah, want to frame it as a, as a, as a possibility. Mm -hmm. So it'd be, that's why I think it's wrong to say nothing changed. Both the Democratic Party and the Labor Party changed. 
and then they failed to take the country with them. So we have to ask why that failure. But it's not as if the parties were not were not themselves trying to change themselves. I think they both have attempted to change in very major ways. And I think the last chapter of that change has not yet been mm. um, been written. If we shift focus and think about economic circumstances and how they may be changing, sometimes I think I define neoliberalism. There are different ways of defining neoliberalism. Sometimes I think of neoliberalism in terms of four freedoms. These are not the four freedoms of Roosevelt's Social Democratic Charter from 1941. There, I've, I've concocted these four freedoms, but I think they apply to neoliberalism. Uh, one is uh, free trade. Uh, Another is free movement of people across borders. A third is free movement of information any, to anywhere in the world, which is what the IT revolution has promised instantaneously without barrier. Uh, and the fourth is free movement of capital. Uh, even before the pandemic and even before Ukraine, levels of international trade had not recovered to where they were before the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. Really? Yeah. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. How far below were they? Like how far? Well, it depends off were they? where you. It depends where you look. You know, during in the early years of um, of the Great Recession, they you know they fell by like twenty percent, and then they recovered as as the world began to recover, and they got close to their older levels. But they had already turned down again before the pandemic struck. So international trade is not on this escalator to the heavens, right? It it, it reached some kind of saturation ceiling and has been slowly declining. And that has to alert us to what we should know. And here's my historical instincts come into play. Uh, there was an earlier period of globalization, late 19th, early 20th century, that World War I blew up. Hmm. So globalization can re reverse itself. Uh, if we see the, uh, if we think of the free movement of people, which um, a global word, world prizes, because you want people to go where they can be used most efficiently or best seek their own fortune, however you want to look at this neo neoliberal world. Uh, in the heyday of neoliberalism, movement was a lot easier between countries than it has now become. And that, you know, Brexit is 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 one sign of that. The the wall that Trump is building is another. The uh, the uh, the EU, of course, still has free internal movement, but it's also stashing a lot of people. It's paying Greece and Turkey to stash a lot of people uh, outside the EU on islands, so they can't they they can't go anywhere else. So there are a lot more barriers to the free movement of people uh, than there uh, than there once were. Uh, we had always imagined that once the digital revolution was unleashed, that there would always be one digital world. It would be a one universal world. But China is assiduously uh, building its own separate internet, which it wants to seal off from the rest of the world, or you enter it only by permission under and under certain circumstances. Russia has been trying to do the same, not with the same success, but it's going to redouble those efforts now. Uh, and uh, I think Modi in India would like to do something similar, as would Erdogan in Turkey. So uh, we now face a possibility that there won't be one unified world of data, uh, but four blocks, four digital worlds. Uh, and you have to talk about balance of power and negotiating transit from one to another. Uh, and the, the final freedom has been the most durable and resistant to, um, to change, and that's been the free movement of capital. But the sanctions imposed on Russia are far more severe than any sanctions imposed on, other, on any other country in terms of uh, obstructing the free movement of capital, freezing Russian assets, uh, if you can, free, and all kinds of countries outside Europe and the United States now are beginning to wonder when their own assets might be frozen by more powerful players in the world. But suddenly a world of severe capital controls of the sort that prevailed before the neoliberal age mm. has become much more easier to imagine. So in other words, the, the, the certain, certain economic plates in the world are shifting and, and the terms of world trade are shifting, the, the terms under which information is exchanged is, is shifting. It, 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 so the, this moment recalls the 1970s in some ways. In, in other words, the, the economies of the world are beginning to restructure. And the experience of Ukraine has got to also make um, corporations begin to reorient. Uh, they're not going to, they're, they're going to, and nations are going to begin to ask, 
what goods are we going to uh, write? The, uh, uh, there are estimates that um, 3,000 out of Britain's 10,000 fish and ship shops may close um, because of all the, you know, so many of the critical ingredients come from Ukraine or Russia or, or the North Sea fish by Russia, the cod coming, coming out of that. Uh, so nations are going to are going to begin to think in different ways, not where we can produce something with the greatest efficiency and we have confidence that it can be shipped here at moment's notice, which has been the way of the neoliberal world. Mm. Countries are beginning to ask and corporations are beginning to ask, what do we have to produce close to home? How can we be assured that the supply lines won't be interrupted? And of course, this applies not just to Europe and Russia, but of course, what hangs in the balance here is, is Taiwan. And corporations have to be thinking, what if China executes something against Taiwan that is similar to what Russia has executed against Ukraine? What about all those goods then that we have been getting from China? Uh, can we depend on those supply lines for much longer? Or do we have to begin to figure out which goods are so critical to the welfare of our corporation or our nation that they either have to be produced domestically or in countries much closer to where we are and whose long-term friendship and alliance we can really count on. Mm. If, if we begin to think that corporations and governments are thinking in these terms, then we begin to imagine a different world emerging, yeah. right? It's not gonna emerge all at once because the, the patterns of the neoliberal world, these supply lines stretching across the world, ships going everywhere all the time, fast, dependable deliveries. I mean, there, you know, this has been in place for 30 or 40 years now. It's, got to, it's not going to change in a night. But we may wake up in five or 10 years and find that economically, economically we inhabit a very different world. Yeah. And that's why I'm not at all confident that the neoliberal world is going to uh, restore itself. Of course, yeah. what comes out of that is, is if the world really does change and what that means politically, mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different question. Yeah, that's definitely a different question. I mean, so yeah, I guess what, what I was getting at were like very sort of party level things that haven't changed um, in terms of policy. What well, you're sort of point, look, pointing at is that I'm, I'm sort of getting quite, I'm not like zooming out and looking at, the, at what's changing on, on like a more national and international scale. Um, so then just to, to finish up then, so yeah, you've got me thinking a lot about where things are going to go. And I mean, I, I had kind of expected the pandemic to lead to a more isolationist sort of style of yeah governance or geopolitics just with with supply chains i mean i don't know i it's hard for me to tell how fast those things are happening because i'm just not involved it, like logistically in um in people trying to rebuild supply chains at the minute and figure out where things can be built and i'm aware that that's not something that can be done overnight so it's not a especially since everything was sort of just like on pause rather than you know for for, for a few years so do you think that the, the pandemic plus this kind of maybe fracturing of the information space um, and the ability for people to, yeah, the, the, yeah, there's probably a little less travel and, and a little less need for people to travel as well due to like Zoom and, and things like this working. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to lead to a more isolationist world uh, and, and that that will that will sort of shape the next political order as such? It well, my, I mean, Zoom uh, is, a, is a more complex proposition because it, we stay home, but we still can connect to people mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. So that the Zoom flows both ways. But yeah, uh, pandemics, suspicion of viruses, um, closed borders. Uh, we haven't talked about the climate yet, uh, but yeah. that you know, the climate is is going to lead to an emphasis on walls and mm. and barriers. And we at the University of Cambridge have just gotten guidelines about how to think about travel in the future and when we can get on an airplane and when we should take a train. And mm. uh, these kinds of ideas are going to continue, continue to spread. And so I, mean, I guess the isolation. thing that would drive the more isolationist would be the climate refugees. Yes, yes. And, and there are as many refugees in the world now as there were at the end of World War II, I think 60 or 70 million. Whoa. Conservative estimates that are there going to be there are going to be another fifty or sixty million refugees in the next thirty or forty years as the land on which they're living either disappears under them, goes under the water, like in Bangladesh or Indonesia, 
uh, or whether as in North Africa, uh, becomes in, inhospitable to life, too hot, crops can't grow, can't, can't sustain yourself. And uh, so, yes, there's going to be an argument for walls, uh, borders. Um, I'm not sure isolationist is, is the best word, but uh, I would say separation, uh, separation of the world into blocks, tribes, um, and, um, and, the, and the kind of easy interchange that we've gotten used to in the neoliberal world um, may ebb or, or, or vanish. And so, uh, uh, again, it's, these are, uh, these changes don't happen with the speed o- upon which Tony Blair or Bill Clinton can change their policies or change their minds. Right. So they're hap- happening at a slower pace, but they're also tend to be more enduring, mm. uh, and, and more fun- fundamental changes. Uh, you can see, how authoritarian eth- ethno nationalism of an eth- authoritarian sort can flourish. We're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it, we're seeing movements toward this Trump, Orban, Putin, um, Erdogan, Modi in India, Bolsonaro, Duarte in the Philippines. These people all recognize themselves in each other. And, uh, and then there are leftist efforts and this is what Corbyn represents and Bernie Sanders to try and rebuild a world on a more progressive foundation and the, the authoritarian out, ethno-nationalist outlines of a future are more clearly etched at this point than the outlines of a progressive world order. But uh, there will be choices that societies and nations have as to um, which way they're going to go. And we just don't, we just don't know yet um, wh- where the world is leading, but I do have the feeling and conviction that we're heading to uh, a different economic order and um, and one in which the politics will be quite different from the uh, neoliberal era. Yeah, I can imagine that's true. But um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to run here. Um, but I really, really want to thank you for your time. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate you taking taking the yeah the time to chat to me about the book. Um, everybody, go check the book out, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order. Um, I'll put the link in the description below. Um, is there anything else you would like to plug? No, just uh, I hope what we've been talking about will encourage um, people to get a copy of my book, published by Oxford University Press, uh, easily available in, in different places of the world still. <laughs> Uh, and uh, to engage the sorts of issues that we've been talking about today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about these matters with you. They matter just not just for my book or to me. I think these issues that are these are issues that affect us all. And the book is meant to have it give us a sense of where we've been, why that's coming apart, and to suggest where we might be going. So um, I hope your listeners, viewers will will some of them will find an interest in the book and think about these issues some more because they are urgent ones for all of us living in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And the book comes highly recommended. So yeah, everyone check it out. um, And thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time. Thanks for listening.